we start again. And uh, uh, the last part of the lecture today is going to be a little shorter. We have about 45 minutes left. So there's a part of uh, material that I'm not going to cover uh, unless we go really fast here, but let's see. All right, we're talking about a pure compound, n dot a king. But a real fuel is never pure compound. Why? Pure compounds. Oh. Is that okay? Oh, okay. You actually see it? Okay. Should I restart? Okay. <laughs> Should I restart? Okay, let's restart. All right, we're talking about the uh, single compound of fuel oxidation. From chemical standpoint, or from thermodynamic standpoint, you, any thermodynamic process having an initial state and having a final state, you wanted to precisely define what the first state is. In the thermodynamic context, it's temperature, it's pressure, it's composition. Okay. In this case, I have a single pure compound. So from mixture composition standpoint, it's fully defined. So I have a fully defined multi-component thermodynamic state. Okay. That's very convenient. The trouble is that no real fuel is really a pure fuel. Simply is because it costs too much. They all come from distillation process, and if you were to distillate out a single compound, refinery won't do it. The gasoline will cost $50 a gallon. So we won't do that. Instead, it's a mixture. By the time you get to a mixture, you lose this what we physical scientists like to see a clearly defined initial thermodynamic state. You can define the temperature, you can define the pressure, but you cannot define the composition. Therefore, for most of us, we panic. What do we do? And that's the reason why we stayed away from real fuel for a very long time. Okay. And let me just use jet fuel as an example. Diesel fuel, gasoline all behave similarly. Uh, real fuel are a mixture of many hydrocarbon compounds can vary from pump to pump, refinery to refinery, and have impurities. <coughs> huh? Ga gasoline has to be transported by pipe, pipes, pipeline, can be transported by trucks. And do you really think anyone go inside of this truck and clean the goo, the rust inside? No, it has impurities. Dominantly, there's still hydrocarbon. So you take a three different type of jet fuel. Jet A is a commercial jet fuel. JP-80 is a military jet fuel. JP-5 is an old military jet fuel. Okay. They differ in composition. They all compose of N-paraffin, isoparaffin, those are the branch of the chain alkenes. N-paraffin is basically N-alkenes. They have cycloparaffins something like a hex, cyclohexene, has dicycloparaffin and aromatics and some other multi-ring compounds in small concentration. Within each of this classification, you have a molecular weight distribution. So for example, in jet A, the smallest paraffin, N-paraffin, is probably around a C7. And then moving to C8, C9, C10, with C11 or C12 to be the most dominant. Okay? It has a distribution and tail off at around 12, 13, 14 carbons. Same is for each other class. So then between those, among those fields, you see the amount of N paraffin can be different. The amount of isoparaffin can also be different. And there are thousands of compounds. If you were to consider the combustion chemistry of this real fuel, you're going to have to have a model for each and every one of those compounds. That's impractical. That's not a problem that can be closed by any fundamental means. So over the last 10 years, 
The research field has focused on a surrogate approach. A surrogate approach saying that, can I develop a mixture of four or five compounds, neat compounds, to mimic the behavior of this more complex soup? For example, to represent the reactivity of n paraffin, I can use n dodecane. To represent the reactivity of isoparaffin, I can use, well, some form of iso, well, for that matter, isooctane. To represent the behavior of a monocycloparaffin, I use butylcyclohexane, and so on and so forth. Okay? In that, by this approach, a problem that can have no fundamental solution is recast into one that can have a fundamental solution. The trouble is, it is just because of that surrogate approach that had led us to this 100,000 reaction model. All right, we're running into another problem. 100,000 reaction with the parameters we don't know and we'll never be able to measure them or calculate them all. An issue I'll talk about Friday. Yet, for this particular problem, if you look at any of this fuel, jet fuel, one important spec coming out from the refinery that you can use this fuel, put it into the engine, making sure this airplane doesn't fly off, doesn't fall off the sky, are two properties as far as chemical properties are concerned. One is the hydrogen to carbon ratio. This needs to be around two. Okay, hydrogen carbon ratio to carbon ratio is two. Second, enthalpy of a combustion or lower heating value needs to be about a 43 megajoule per kilogram. Chemically, just, they just need to satisfy these two specs, two properties. So what did the system actually do? Why well, these two specs are sufficient from a practical standpoint, despite the fact we don't understand it yet? The answer is in thermodynamics. And the answer is in the behavior we just discussed. Let me just use one example to show you for a more complex diesel fuel. Again, this is a similar measurement to n dodecane. Okay? Except for now, this is done for a diesel fuel, pre-vaporized, mixed with oxygen, in 4% oxygen in argon. In experiment, you typically don't want to do, do this experiment in air is because laser diagnostics is the best when you dilute the mixture. You don't get too much background noise and other problems associated with that. What you see here is, well, it's not easy to measure the total fuel. For that, a total fuel is not even defined. You have to know what compounds you're looking at in order to do the measurement. So rather, they follow ethylene. This is another measurement done by Professor Hansen's group. Same thing as we saw earlier. In a multi-component fuel, over a period of time, with ignition occurring around 1,200 microsecond, within the first two, 300 microsecond, the fuel is entirely replaced by ethylene. The fact that ethylene stays constant above tells us that fuel pyrolysis has been complete. What's remaining? is about oxidation of ethylene leading to ignition and a complete consumption of hydrocarbon leading to carbon dioxide formation. Real fuel behaves very similarly. Remember, if we know what are the products produced or if we can probe what type of products that are produced in a pyrolytic process, and if we have means to describe the exact kinetics of oxidation, of the pyrolysis products, we can achieve prediction for this ignition. There are some other curves uh, uh, shown on the plot. Those are model prediction using a single component, single compound fuel. Okay? They were close by detailed chemistry, but we're not that close. All right. So then fundamentally, let me ask you the question. Why is that for any complex fuel, you pyrolyze it? you always end up having a small group of intermediates. Why can't you have thousands of these intermediates? After all, I started with thousands of compounds in the real field, right? 
What is the reason? Why, when you heat up this fuel, nature simplifies for us that such that each and every time you always burn the same, well, oxidize the same intermediate. It's in thermodynamics. So let me explain this chart. It's a little bit complicated. Remember the enthalpy of formation entropy in a Gibbs free energy. Okay? Let's look at that chart first. So this is my fuel. In this case, it's a 43 megajoule per kilogram, lower heating value. That value is for a jet fuel. And it has a carbon to hydrogen ratio of 1 to 2, and with mean molecular weight around C11H22. So that's my real fuel. Okay? And uh, I ask the question, if I heat this compound at 1300 Kelvin, isothermal, fix the pressure of a 10 bar. What are the possible thermodynamic products this system like to go to? Equilibrium product. Okay? Remember, thermodynamics provide a driving force. Thermodynamics gives us an end state. Kinetics is something about how fast this process is going to take place. So we're going to define the problem from the standpoint of thermodynamics because after all, if you look at this, the message from those experiments is the cracking process is very fast. Even if I assume the total time it takes is zero, my prediction for the entire uh, uh, desirable property to predict is still, still 700 microseconds. So I can get away without worrying too much about the kinetics here. I just need to know what are the equilibrium products produced. The very fact ethylene stays constant, meaning tells us that a system is in quasi-equilibrium. If it's not in quasi-equilibrium, kinetically something still evolving, you should see ethylene is going to move up or moving down in this whole process. The fact that it stays relatively constant tells us that this is a thermodynamic end state or quasi end state. Okay. So let's go back to look at this chart. First of all, if I just dumping everything possible into my pot, all possible species that I can consider, what comes about the most stable favored thermodynamic state and the equilibrium condition is total carbon, total hydrogen. Guess what? If you pyrolyze a fuel, you leave, leave fuel in the chamber for long enough, you heat it up to this temperature, wait for 10 days. You come back, the fuel will be gone, replaced by carbon coated on inside of a wall and hydrogen. So why is carbon production so dominant? Because of releasing in hydrogen. For each mole of a pseudo fuel called a C11H22, you pyrolyze it to carbon, it also releases you 11 hydrogen. This 11 hydrogen increases the entropy tremendously. So therefore, if you look at the reaction enthalpy, that's this blue line. Versus the entropy, of course, multiplied by temperature, that's this green line. This process is slightly endothermic. So from in the enthalpy standpoint, it doesn't like to get there. But from entropy standpoint, because you release so many hydrogen, you get a significant reduction or increase in entropy or reduction in the value of t time, negative t times s. You add these two lines together, you have the red line that's the Gibbs free energy. Remember? Driving force for any chemical reaction is Gibbs free energy wants to come down. Okay? And the minimum in Gibbs free energy is the equilibrium state. This is because of hydrogen. You take a fuel, you heat it up, fuel hydrogen will do its conspiracy. They want to go free release themselves from the fuel. That's what is driving it. It's entropy. But now you say, in the flame front, or in this case, I don't see carbon forming. Why don't I see carbon forming? It takes too long to get there. That's kinetics. Okay? So then, then you say, I'm going to chop carbon. I'm going to build a thermodynamic wall here. I'm not going to let in carbon to be converted to graphite in 
in an equal chemical chem king calculation, you throw away the carbon from your thermodynamic data file, which is equivalent by going into this NASA polynomial assigned enthalpy of formation for the species infinitely high. You never get there. So you build a wall. You throw away carbon, that's what you get. You don't let me to form carbon. I still want to form hydrogen because my driving force is I want to go free. I want to minimize my entropy. So in doing so, it will produce a bit of methane to compound things out. But even more important is a form aromatics. This is pyrene. Pyrene is a smaller molecular unit of a graphene. It's the precursor to graphite. Understandable? You don't let four carbon to form. I'll form something about to become carbon. All right. You then throw pyrene out of the consideration. What do you get? I'm sorry, this is not easy to see. You have benzene. You have toluene. Hydrogen still dominate, for that's what's driving it. You compensate things because you have to conserve hydrogen to carbon ratio. You produce a little methane to keep in the hydrogen to carbon ratio 2 to 1. You said, I don't like benzene. It takes too long to form benzene. After all, in Ron Hansen's measurement, there is no more benzene. You throw benzene out, aha, things become closer and closer to what you observe. Hydrogen becomes smaller. You have methane, and this is ethylene. I don't, what is this compound? Acetylene, C2H2. This greenish pi area is acetylene. You have some C4, you have some C3. You throw acetylene out. Did I throw acetylene out? I did not. What did I throw out here? Oh, I did throw acetylene out. Sorry, don't match the color. They don't match here. This is acetylene. Here now, this is ethylene, my apology. Then ethylene becomes more dominant. You ask, say, conversion of kin kinetically converting ethylene to acetylene takes time. So let me throw that out. And then if you want to say, I want to throw all the C4s out, the last one, what do you get? Pure ethylene. Almost a pure ethylene. Keeping in mind that a pure ethylene has a hydrogen to carbon ratio of two, matching the few exactly. So, dynamically, this whole thing is about producing hydrogen. In some way, if you can limit the production of a hydrogen through eliminating large hydrocarbon, mostly in dehydrogen, dehydrogenated species, like aromatics, like acetylene, and ethylene obviously become dominating. So in a flame front, or in during oxidation of endodecane, or for that matter, during oxidation of any real fuel, all right, system somehow get stuck over here by kinetics. You ask why? Why it doesn't go all the way there? Why it takes so long to get there? It's because this whole process is entropy driven. Entropy wants to go up. This is endothermic from the fuel to this state, to that state, to that state. The total enthalpy goes up. Therefore, taking the difference of the two, you have to put energy into the process in order for it to occur. Under adiabatic condition, if I were to paralyze this fuel, in order to get there, my temperature must go down. When temperature goes down, kinetics goes slower. So it's a negative feedback. It's a negative feedback because the more pyrolysis you have to do, the lower the temperature. The lower the temperature, the lower the kinetic rate. The lower the kinetic rate, the less the pyrolysis you can do. This is just like grandpa clock. OK? You have two competing effects that lock each other into a certain state. They can't go very far. All right. that is an additional behavior responsible for the fact of doesn't matter how you burn the fuel, combustion process don't look very different. 
without this property, you would imagine that you're gonna, we're going to be able to see a lot more flame phenomena. Okay. All right. If I were to prove myself to be right kinetically, I have a reaction model. Don't ask me how I got that. I spent 10 years of my life on this. And now I'm going to tell myself that this was a wasted effort. We learned a lot in that process. That's a detailed chemical model. This detailed chemical model actually take a particular few compound, in this case, n butylsaccharohexene. We write exactly each and every reaction step that I think should exist. It was a painful process. It's a painful process because that is entirely empirical. Empirical in a sense that I have to guess the reaction pathways. There are many that are easy. Betaization process, I told you. And I'll write down a set of rate parameter based on chemical class assumption for type of for chemical reaction that behaves similar. I'll assume the rate constant are the same. Okay, and I write down this reaction mechanism that has about a thousands of reaction and about a, you know eight nine hundred chemical species. And I use it to predict the flame structure. So again, this is a busy plot. Let me explain. I have a mole fraction here or temperature here as a function of distance. So this is a laminar premixed flame at an equivalence ratio of 1.2, unburned temperature of 298, and one atmosphere pressure. This is cold unburned. This is hot burned. So if you look at the temperature, it's moving from a low temperature to a high temperature, reaching adiabatic flame temperature of 2,200 Kelvin. Then let's look at the detail. It's very complicated here, so let me just mark a few things. First of all, you look at oxygen, okay, from unburned to burned. And then this blue curve is very useful. It's CH star. What this is is an electronically excited CH radical. Traces amount of this species are produced in any flame, burning hydrocarbon. It's electronically excited, and as it relaxes itself to the ground state, it emits a photon. That photon happens to have be in the blue wavelength range. This is what you observe when the flame is blue. So therefore, if this radical peaks, this is where the blue flame is. Okay, but then if you compare where the blue flame is versus the fuel and butyl cyclohexene, you see the fuel is gone, long gone before it gets to the flame. What are they replaced by? Dominantly ethylene, methane, propene, three dominant compounds. Okay, and this is the pyrolysis region. <coughs> It takes a total of about 100 microseconds, occurring in a temperature range of 1050 to 1450 Kelvin. Flame usually starts at around 1600 Kelvin. The reason why flame starts at 1600 Kelvin is typically because the chain branching H plus O2 reaction becomes faster than H plus O2 forming HO2 chain termination. Okay, I won't talk about this too much, but this is the dividing temperature for one atmospheric pressure. So what you look at this is that for if you were to burn a large fuel, you actually have a decouple the pyrolysis process from oxidation. Then if you burn a real fuel, despite of the fact it's a multi-component, nature simplified itself because of the dominant impact of thermodynamics, you're gonna get stuck here, doesn't matter what, few compounds you have in this multi-component mixture. Things become very simple. Yes? Does your uh, time constant for that change? The time constant do change, but the time constant uh, can change quite a bit. However, in comparison to the overall time scale, that variation is so small, you don't have to worry about it. Okay, I'll show you one chart. Uh, underlying this behavior. 
So this is a time constant issue. Okay. If I take a slice of this flame front, now I'm going to take a few n dot a k. Different fields give you somewhat a different kinetic response time. But still, they are very fast. Doesn't matter what fuel you burn. For that, chemical bond strength among different fuels are not wildly different. Okay. What you find is that if I were to polarize n dot a k in nitrogen, initial temperature 1400 Kelvin, and at the base of that flame, I take that slice and I shall do time dependent on kinetics. What you find is that indeed the pyrolysis is down mostly in the first 100 microseconds. The fuse and Dr. King starts here. At the end of 100 microseconds, you have about a few percent left. What are they replaced by? Dominantly ethylene. Some hydrogen, propene, one butene, and then you have ethene and methane. These are one, two, three, four, five, six compounds driven by thermodynamics, produced within a very short period of time, and after that, the system got stuck. Stuck. Stuck, you won't go to the next batch of favored equilibrium products. Why? This cracking process is endothermic. Temperature goes down, everything got frozen. And then, for a very long period of time, up to about 500 microseconds, as a matter of fact, I can plot this up to 5 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, this soup stays constant, waiting to be transported into the flame to get oxidized. That explains why for complex fuels, whether it's Jet A, Jet 5, or a JP8, Jet A coming from different pump, pump, from different refinery, you should not be scared of stepping into the airplane. You're always going to burn exactly the same thing. All right. If so, then this, in my own opinion, is the future direction of kinetics. All what you have to do is map out this composition. This composition, driven by thermodynamics, doesn't vary that much. As long as you know the initial hydrogen to carbon ratio of the fuel, you know the thermodynamic enthalpy of combustion, in other words, enthalpy of formation, you have no problem to map out these four practical conditions. All right. All right. So again, it's a time scale. And I won't explain where I got those values. They are approximate, but they are pretty accurate. Forming ethylene takes about 100 microseconds. Regardless of what a few you have, it's of order of that. They may vary between 50 microseconds to 500 microseconds, but it doesn't matter. Okay? You just have to crack it down before you enter into the flame. And there's also an issue with the flame dynamics. For those of you who had taken combustion physics class and understand the meaning of Lewis number, how many of you have learned Lewis number? Quite many. You have to match something in the flame in order for, for the flame to be stable. Okay? Going back to that, without the fuel to have the ability to crack down, you're going to run into problem making this flame stable. Why? Oxygen is lighter, fuel is heavier. Oxygen, therefore, diffuses faster than the fuel. Therefore, you're always going to run into a problem of mismatching between the two reactants. Correct? And therefore, it's a difficult game, cat and mouse game, to play. Then, nature is beautiful. The beautiful thing nature did for us was to simplify this problem by cracking a few into dominant ethylene. What's the molecular weight of ethylene? 28. What's the molecular weight of nitrogen? 28. They have the same molecular weight. The same molecular weight allow you to have the same mass diffusivity. Now you have no problem. Everything is lubricated. They all march at the same, well, roughly, same pace into the flame. 
And it's for that reason you can burn many, many different fuels without being impacted by specifics of that chemistry. Already? Any dominant phenomena in nature must have a very simple, simple, logical explanation behind it. Like an evolution theory, if you think about it, this is the only explanation, there's no other explanation. Just because logical is beautiful. This is one of them. Okay? It has to be. Or else, there are many combustion phenomena. It will be very difficult for us to explain many other combustion phenomena. All right, so in terms of time scale, producing this more, uh, methane, producing acetylene, it's just a time scale event problem. And of course, this also explains when you don't have oxygen in the system, how soot form. You leave the unburned hydrocarbon cracked for long enough, about 10 milliseconds, gas turbines typically operate around 5 milliseconds, with some mixing involved. So the effective time is a little longer. The overall residence time is a 5 milliseconds. Okay. You're going to see aromatics and to an extent high aromatics formation. That's soot. All right. So, all right. Uh, I thought that I should uh, 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 spend a little bit of time. I only left with 10 minutes. I go through this really fast about pollutant formation. And you heard from me on Monday that what drives the science of combustion chemistry initially wasn't because of engine efficiency. It's largely because we wanted to be able to predict pollutant emission. That was a driving force starting from the mid 70s. And because of it, combustion chemistry research had boomed since then. Okay. Pluton formation. Pluton formation is also, to an extent, how combustion gets its bad name. We are always the problem. We as a com <laughs> I hate, this doesn't sound right. This whole thing that we practice causes problems. What are the problems? Energy security. Climate change, air pollution, so on and so forth. In that thing, we hear so many negative news <clears throat> that we forgot what we have done. And as Theory Point Song pointed out during uh, the Korea panel, we've improved combustion efficiency over the last 30 years in practical engines by at least a factor of two. We lower the pollutant emission by a couple orders of magnitude, all through a better understanding of the combustion processes. That's a remarkable achievement. That's a remarkable achievement in many ways if I were to be, if I'm biased, and I'm biased to an extent, compared to development of fuel cells. Do you know? Go back to look at the literature and look at the history. The Vada effect leading to the development of fuel, fuel cells. That idea was developed in 1840. Photovoltaic effect was uncovered in 1850, plus minus. And many of the things we talk about today in energy conversion or alternative energy conversion, as far as the concept is concerned, was all developed about 160 years ago. Why? They were in the same game. Cheap, efficient energy conversion. In the process, combustion-based energy conversion won. Why did combustion-based energy won? Not because of anything else, it's because of power density. Combustion has enormous power density, and you next time you go pump gas into the car, go calculate in terms of equivalent power input into your gasoline tank you get an enormous number in a unit of megawatt equivalent. So, of course, photovoltaic, we have seen tremendous growth. Wind air power, we've seen tremendous growth. But if you put all this technology in parallel, we're not any shabbier. We have improved the process. Well, how we got a bad name is that we always are associated 
with a problem. Okay? We're always playing a defense game. Because of the problem, we cannot play offense. That's part of the problem. Okay? But we need to understand this problem. And we need to understand a larger problem that combustion is problematic, in addition to what I talked about earlier. As far as energy conversion is concerned, turning high quality chemical energy to thermal energy, then use this thermal energy to do work is a lousy idea. But practically, practically, it's very hard, difficult to beat the power density of a combustion. Okay? But nonetheless, we need to think about a problem. And I think a com combustion, you, some of you asked uh, this question during the uh, lunchtime career panel. I believe personally hybrid is the future. And combustion is 50% of a solution to that transportation problem. And we still have, are faced with energy efficiency problem and air pollution problem. Okay? So we need to learn a little bit of that. So as far as pollutant formation, we have several classes of pollutants. Hydrocarbon, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides. SOX is mostly associated with burning coal. Sulfur, as a mineral matter, is in the coal itself. We have particulates, mostly soot or the smoke. And if you argue the final combustion product, CO2, Regularly speaking, should be classified as some kind of air pollutant because of the greenhouse effect and its impact or potential impact on the global climate. All right. Improve combustion efficiency will fundamentally will reduce carbon dioxide. But in addition to it, what's critical here for us to do is NOx and the particulates. Those are two important air pollutants in the combustion process. Nitrogen oxides is related to photochemical smog. We don't feel this problem uh, today in US cities as much as you, you, it used to be 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Okay. Uh, in other parts of the world, it remains to be bad. For example, in Beijing, I forgot one of this is Mexico City. Anyone can tell me which one is Mexico City? Anyone? Or oh, neither is. My apologies. I thought I had one in Mexico City. Okay. Uh, in flames, well, NOx in many ways is, is associated with uh, uh, photochemical smog. The haze is associated with NOx emission from combustion. There are three mechanisms responsible for NOx emission in combustion. The first mechanism is called the Seldovich uh, thermal NOx. And it's inherent to any combustion process. Don't worry about the first reaction. The key reaction is the second one. Remember, one of the key radicals in the reaction process in combustion is O atom. Nitrogen is otherwise not very reactive, but it can react with O atom. And O atom attacks nitrogen from NO. You then have an N atom. N atom attacks the molecular oxygen, produce another NO. So this is a straight chain reaction process. As long as you have O atom, you can form NO. The question is how much NO? How fast this kinetic chain uh, cycle is? Yes. And then about the, uh, this is understood a long time ago, and this was in the context of high speed vehicles, and you're gonna, you know, uh, 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 power lines, ambient air, and this is where the first reaction comes in. Uh, about 40 years ago, we also realized that, that there's a few bond, not a few, originated uh, uh, radic uh, uh, NO. If you take a CH2 radical, take a methyl, strip another hydrogen away, you have a methylene. Methylene is very reactive, it can also react with molecular nitrogen, forming hydrogen cyanide. Okay? And potassium cyanide is, of course, very toxic. Hydrogen cyanide is not that good either, but in a gas phase, it's not that bad. Well, it's bad. And hydrogen cyanide undergo additional reaction with O atom, form NCO, and NCO react with 
hydrogen ion form NH. And NH reacted with H ion to form N. So there's a long sequence of reaction process, eventually ending in NO. And of course, fuel, practical fuel is never pure. It always has a certain amount of nitrogen in it. The reason for that is because petroleum comes from millions of years ago, living things. Living things always have nitrogen in it, so all fuel would contain a small amount of nitrogen. In coal, it's a little bit more than petroleum. In petroleum, it's a little more than perhaps natural gas. They're always there. And in ambient air, NOx is undergo, gonna go undergo photochemical reaction. So it receives a photon, spill it into NO. So what do we form here is NO and in exhaust the pipe. When temperature goes down, NO reacts rapidly with oxygen, form NO2. So what is being emitted into the ambient air is NO2. Okay? NO2 can undergo a range of radical uh, 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 chain reaction facilitated by photons. So for example, NO can be photolyzed to form NO plus O in ambient air. O reacts with o, O2 to form ozone, okay, and so on. Two aspects. First, the production of ozone. Ozone is an oxidant. It leads to a variety of health problems. All right. Second is the, re is the photon. This photon is in some way, not all, the full mechanism for photochemical smog is a lot more complex than I show here, but this chemical soup do absorb photons and do scatter photons in a different way, leading to this smog, okay, the grayish, darkish, uh, 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 cloud-like air. That's because interaction of the pollutants with the sunlight. Uh, soot emission. I know I'm about to run out of time, so I try to just show you perhaps two more slides that we call quick. Soot, smoke, coming from airplane, ships. Uh, we don't use this kind of thing anymore, but we do use this, okay? And from stationary power production. Soot is thought to impact the global climate, and its exact impact is not well understood yet. Many things has been postulated, some enhance the climate, uh, 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 global warming, some reduce global warming, okay? And soot can be deposited on the polar ice, leading to great amount of light absorption and ice melting, polar ice melting, thus raising the sea level. Uh, mixed uh, snow with uh, dirty soot, cause brownish uh, 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 snowflakes, again leading to great amount of light absorption. And you have regional clouds that's brownish, again that's a mix between ice crystal in the clouds with soot. And believe it or not, contrail following a jet is the result of nucleation of ice crystal on soot particles. All right, you all know that the water, pure water does not nucleate into droplets. You have to have some dirt to allow it to form. And this contrail, now, by now we know that much of it comes from condensation of water vapor. Where the water vapor come from? Come, come from a turbine engine as a combustion product. <coughs> Chilled, cooled, condensed onto soot particle. But by and large, the effect of soot is in increased cloud density because of this induced new cloud nucleation phenomenon, such that if you examine its potential radiative forcing comparing to effect on CO2, methane, and other uh, 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 chemical compound, the direct and a cloud albedo effect of the soot particle remains to be very large, but they are in opposite direction as carbon dioxide. This is the biggest unknown in the global climate model. You see the uncertainty bar. And this phenomenon has been explored by some crazy people. This, I have to say, crazy people. That the way to deal with global climate change 
and greenhouse effect is pumping particles, soot, into the stratosphere, increase cloud density, that problem can be fundamentally solved. I don't know about you, I don't want to do this experiment. <laughs> if you don't do it carefully, you're going to run into a deep freeze. Okay? Do you know that without carbon dioxide and water vapor, what would be the main Earth temperature? Anybody? Negative 16 degrees. So without carbon dioxide and water, the Earth will be, would be frozen. Carbon dioxide and water isn't bad. It's when you have too much of it, it becomes a problem. Okay? And then over the past millions of years, we have gone through several ice age. The mean temperature is not, by all means, much, much lower than today. If the mean temperature is 10 degrees C lower, you're going to see glacier advance or cover a large part of North America. So small change in mean temperature can cause very large effect. And because of it, I don't think we have the knowledge to do this experiment. Because if you don't do this experiment carefully or understand everything, you're going to run into a deep freeze man-induced ice age. All right, uh, so uh, this one more chart, I'm going to, uh, two more charts, no, no. i tell you what, it's getting late, everybody's tired, we'll come back tomorrow and uh, talk a little bit about the soon, okay? <laughs>